Welcome back to Timeline World History. I'm Dan, the fan of history, and I will be reading this episode. The episode was researched and written by Shane Soresby. In the last episode, we mentioned that agriculture had started to make its way up the Danube to an area known today as the Iron Gates, which occupies the boundary between Romania and Serbia. There were two possible ways that agriculture reached this particular area either up the east coast of Bulgaria or from directly across the Black Sea itself. Well, however agriculture got there, by 6200 BC, people had started to settle down and one particular culture would arise that was named after the type site located near the Serbian capital Belgrade. This was Starcevo, the earliest Neolithic culture in the Balkans, and we start this episode there. Starcevo was first excavated between 1931 and 1932 by the University Museum in Philadelphia, the Peabody Museum and Fogg Art Museum of Harvard University in Massachusetts and the American School of Prehistoric Research. A preliminary report on the settlement was published a year later in 1933. It found that parts of the site had been destroyed by clay mining in 1912. That means that this site had been around for 8,000 years and just 19 years before the archaeologists got there it was partially destroyed by clay mining. That's kind of sad, I think. The culture was distributed over a west area of the Balkan region. In the north it reached as far as the Transdanubia region located south of Lake Balaton in western Hungary. Other settlers located themselves between the rivers Sava and Drau in eastern Croatia. Remains can also be found in Serbia, Kosovo, Bosnia and northern Croatia. Similar cultures to the Starcevo included the Koros in Hungary, named after the river Koros, the Kris in Romania, the Karanovo in Bulgaria, the early Neolithic cultures of eastern Albania and Macedonia and the Sesklo culture in northern Greece. It is sometimes known by the alternative name of Stacevo Koros Chris, as highlighted on the map. And I'm sorry for butchering these Balkan names if anybody is offended. In terms of settlement themselves, very few can be analyzed. In Divostin, a village located in Stanovo, Serbia, two different types of houses were excavated. One consisted of a roundish or elliptical sized hut 3 to 5 meter in length, 2 to 4 meter wide, that was partially built into the ground. It was surrounded by thin posts. Inside it contained a central hearth for warmth and cooking. The second type consisted of a post house that had a rectangular ground plan. Walls were made of wattle and daub with trenches alongside. Floors were made of stamped clay. It is difficult to establish how large these settlements were due to the dearth of finds. It is probable that these were only small villages that had an economy based on agriculture and stock breeding, particularly sheep and goat rather than cattle. Despite this, hunting and gathering continued to play a significant role in the diet. Old habits are not easy to get rid of. The discovery of pottery fragments by V. Milocic in 1949 led him to divide the Stalcevo culture into four distinct phases. At the beginning of the period in 6200 BC, pottery was coarse, rough and unpainted. After that it began to be painted first in white before much darker colors were used, including dark brown as well as black being painted onto a red slip. The third phase of the culture contained pottery that was either black or black and white painted onto a red slip. This started to include motifs consisting of net patterns, spirals, garlands and floral patterns painted onto bowls, cups, small dishes and vessels. Finally, by the end of the culture in 5500 BC, paintings started to deteriorate in quality. A couple of examples of Starcevo pottery are shown on this slide. It was part of a series of cultures in Southeast Europe that used painted pottery, as opposed to the Cardium pottery culture that used pottery decorated with impressions such as cockle shell, as noted in the previous episode. Uh, or the Bug Neister culture that used pottery with a pointed base, again decorated with impressions. One distinctive feature 
of the Southeast European Early Neolithic is that there were very few graves around. From the few that have been found, burials were single grave inhumations rather than the later cremations and intended to be located within the settlement. Children were buried in a crouched position, lying on either their left or right side. Very rarely were individuals laid on their back or front. Noticeably were the distinct lack of grave goods. Of those found, fragments of vessels, grinding stones, flint tools or yule were buried with the deceased. The Sarchivo was eventually superseded by the Vinca culture in 5500 BC. Moving further south from the Balkans into the Aegean Sea, southeast of mainland Greece, lies the large island of Crete. Crete has been relatively quiet in our story so far. Yes, there was a possibility, however remote, that somehow our hominid cousins had arrived on the island 130,000 years ago. This theory came about following the discovery of Archeulan hand axes by Thomas F. Strasser of Providence College in Rhode Island between 2008 and 2009. But if we're talking about actual settlers, then we need to look at the start of Neolithic Crete. How the first settlers came to Crete is a matter of debate. Did they derive from existing Paleolithic and Mesolithic hunter-gatherers? And if so, when did they arrive on the island? Or were they no newcomers arriving by boat from Anatolia, Cyprus or the Levant? If you go with the latter theory, then these people would have arrived sometimes during the 7th millennium BC, bringing with them sheep, pigs, cattle and domesticated wheat, barley and lentils. But where to settle? Well, the north of the island looked the most attractive to them, and indeed it wasn't long before a small settlement appeared by 6000 BC. This settlement would later grow to become one of the most important settlements in Bronze Age Crete, complete with its own palace and possibly, according to myth, a labyrinth containing a bull-headed monster known as the Minotaur. This is of course Knossos, and its history is marked closely with that of Neolithic Crete. Forget the Greek myth, this is the real story of Knossos. For a start we have to thank the main specialist of the Neolithic Aegean, John Davis Evans, who has no relation to the famous Arthur Evans, who excavated the Minoan Palace at Knossos over a 30 year period, starting in 1900. Following further excavations carried out by J.D. Evans in pits and trenches around the remains of the palace, he was able to summarize Neolithic Crete and Knossos in particular into separate specific periods. At the start of the Neolithic, in what became known as the Aceramic, Knossos was a small settlement of between 20 and 50 people living in buildings made of unbaked mud brick which is likely to be washed away in a sudden downpour or from a combination of stones, mud and mud brick. Living on the north coast did have its advantages though, and in order to obtain the necessary materials to make axes, mace heads, knives and arrowheads, they utilized the Aegean Sea to travel north to the nearby island of Milos in the Cyclades that contained both stone and obsidian, that precious volcanic glass similar to that found at Katalhöyük in Anatolia. Although this, these early settlers did not use pottery, they were able to use clay for other means, such as the manufacture of female figurines, which Arthur Evans attributed to the worship of a Neolithic mother goddess and to their religion in general. In 5700 BC, in what was known as the Early Neolithic, Knossos grew to a settlement of between 200 and 600 people who occupied the area of what would later be the Minoan Palace and on slopes situated to the north and the west. Levels 8 to 9 contained buildings rectangular in shape that were constructed of fired mud brick. At least it won't wash away now, so they have obviously learned from their mistakes this time around or they discovered the means to fire them. From level 7 onwards, buildings were constructed of poured mud on either field or recycled stone foundations. 
Inside, they had one or two rooms that were lined with mud plaster. Roofing over these structures was flat and fairly thick, allowing unsupported spans to be kept small. Central hearths kept these occupants warm and cozy. One unusual house in Knossos under the West Court had eight rooms and covered 50 square meters in size. Those must have been some small rooms. With walls built at right angles, large stones for support, storage areas and a central door. Could this be the head of the settlement's house? Unlike the aceramic, pottery started to be introduced, which was generally dark surfaced and burnished, decorated with incised and dot impressed motifs that was often filled with um, white or red paste. The technology behind this kind of pottery, particularly its complex handles and rims, was likely to have been imported from outside but it could easily have been copied from other containers made of wood or reeds. Between 4000 and 3600, known as the Middle Neolithic, the population of Knossos increased further to between 500 and 1000 people. Although no apparent changes were made to the architecture, people did start to live in much more substantial and private family homes rather than the egalitarian way of life from the previous early Neolithic. Despite lack of changes, windows and doors were introduced that were made of timber. A fixed raised central hearth occupied the room and cabinets, beds and pilasters occupied the perimeter. Underneath the later palace, a great house was discovered with an area of 100 square meters. It was made of stone that was divided into five rooms with evidence suggesting that it contained two stories, uh, as meter thick walls have been found. Unlikely to have been a private resident, it was likely, uh, residence, it was likely to have been used as a communal or public meeting place, although it could have been the predecessor of the palace. New shapes in pottery increased, with ripple relief decoration becoming popular, although the overall style was the same as the early Neolithic. First evidence appeared of a weaving industry in the form of spindle whorls, loom weights and shuttles. Rock crystal made its first appearance to manufacture maze heads and axes. The final Neolithic period between 3600 and 2800 BC saw a dramatic increase in population at Knossos, possibly as a result of new arrivals from outside of Crete. Two large buildings were excavated by Arthur Evans under the central court of the later palace. They contained two fixed hearths, unlike anything seen in the preceding Neolithic periods. It was certainly unusual for later Minoan Crete. One of the buildings contained 15 rooms. Now we're getting near to palace size. Pottery remained unchanged, except that crusted decorations started to appear by 2800 BC. Evidence of metal artifacts appeared with the discovery of a copper axe in one of the buildings that Mr. Evans excavated. We will be covering the Copper Age in a later episode. As well as Knossos, people started to settle in Phaistos, Magasa and other areas in west and central Crete. In Magasa, an unusual two-roomed structure with no less than 19 stone axes and four millstones, as well as obsidian fragments were found that suggested that the building was used either as a toolmaker's workshop or possibly as a sheepfold. Whatever its function was, it was certainly unusual for prehistoric Crete. In regards to burials, infants and children tended to be buried in pits under the floors of houses in Knossos between the Aceramic and Middle Neolithic periods. During the Late Neolithic, Caves and rock shelters served as burial places in other parts of Crete. It would be the succeeding Bronze Age in 2800 BC that would herald the next stage in ancient Crete, but you will have to wait a while before we get to that. Sailing east from Crete, you will eventually arrive on the western coast of the Mediterranean in an area known as the Levant. By this period, people had moved away north and eastwards to parts of Syria and northern Iraq. 
In the previous episode, we had covered those who settled in Syria, known as the Halaf culture. Well, in 5800 BC, a sister, sister culture emerged in the foothills of northern Iraq, known then as Mesopotamia, called the Hasuna culture. It was named after the type site of Tel Hasuna that emerged in Nineveh province, 22 miles southwest from modern-day Mosul. It was discovered in 1942 by Fuad Safar before being excavated between 1943 and 1944 by Seton Lloyd, who led a team from the Iraqi Directorate General of Antiquities. This revealed an advanced village culture that spread throughout northern Mesopotamia. In approximately 6000 BC, people moved to the foothills of northern Mesopotamia to practice a type of agriculture known as dry farming. Like the Halaf culture of Syria, Tel Hasuna became one of the most important centers for the Neolithic economy, in particular for cultivation and raising livestock. Inhabitants led the way in improving agriculture, settling in river valleys, beginning the process of irrigation and progressing all forms of production and culture. Before the discovery of Tel Hasuna, southern Mesopotamia was considered the cradle of civilization, but when settlements started to be discovered in the north, such as Tel Hasuna, Yarmo, Sanara and Tel Halaf, the north became an important region in the story of Mesopotamia. At Tel Hasuna, six different layers of housing were uncovered. Buildings were built of packed mud, varying in size uh, of between 20 to 50 centimeters. This technique of mud bricks was probably developed from southern Mesopotamia, where it was common in the early 6th millennium BC. Later buildings were built of stone, around an open central court. Settled agricultural life was reflected in the finds of hand axes, sickles, grinding stones, bins, baking ovens, and bones of domesticated animals. They do not seem to be as advanced as those found at Yarmo, as tools were made out of flint and obsidian. Trade with Katalhoyuk? Possibly. Female figurines were used for worship, Jar burials contained food that was used for people to take to the next world after death, so there may have been a belief in an afterlife. Uh, various vessels and pottery found in six layers were dated to a period between 5600 and 5300 BC. With similar vessels being found across the Middle East, it showed that there was an extensive trade network across the region as early as the 6th millennium BC. Pottery can be divided into three different categories. Hasuna archaic, Hasuna standard and Samaran. Samaran painted fine wear was always monochrome, but it seemed that all three types of paint had been used, including black, dark violet brown and a medium chocolate brown. In general, designs were carefully painted although parallel lines did diverge slightly, and there was a variation of some lines suggesting the usage of a soft painting brush. The Hasuna and contemporary Halaf cultures were superseded by a culture from southern Mesopotamia that had originally commenced in approximately 6500 BC. We have not covered them yet, but by 5400 BC they had begin, began to influence the rest of Mesopotamia albeit not by military conquest. We will know more about them in the next episode as we turn our attention to the south where people have lived among the marshlands near the Arabian Sea, the famous sea land of the future Chaldeans. What was happening in China during this period? Well, one Neolithic culture emerged on a mountain slope south of the Qinshui River in Kinan County, Gansu province. After 20 years of excavation, study and collation, archaeologists made a number of breakthroughs at the type site of Dadivan that gave its name to the culture. Breaking six Chinese archaeological records these finds were of great significance in understanding the progression 
of the Chinese Neolithic in the Yellow River Valley. Archaeologists have found 240 houses, 98 cooking stoves, 325 pits or cellars, 71 mausoleums, 35 kilns and 12 irrigation canals and ditches that contained 4,147 pieces of pottery, 1,931 stone artifacts, 2,218 bone horn teeth or muscle artifacts and 7,000 animal skeletons, very precise figures. Like in northern Mesopotamia, the Dadivan culture practiced dry farming. Carbonized ancient millet specimens known as Yi were found in the earliest layers that was contemporary with those found in Greece. This pushes back the original date of dry farming in China by 1000 years, but it proved that the earliest crops were of the Yi variety of millet rather than the later Su type that became prevalent from 5000 BC. More than 200 power, uh, colorful pottery artifacts that included a three-foot earthenware bowl was unearthed in the earliest layers. Thought to be the earliest found in China, these 8,000-year-old purple-red dots, uh, red <laughs> purple-red pots, dated the skills of Chinese pottery make, uh, makers 1,000 years earlier than previously thought. If you remember back two episodes previously. We mentioned the earliest Chinese characters known as the Yiahu symbols that were dated to 6600 BC. Controversy surrounded these symbols as some researchers suggested they were a forerunner to Chinese characters and language used by the Shang dynasty in 1200 BC. Well, another candidate has come forward with 10 different types of color symbols found at Dadivan that predated those found on pottery at Banpu in Changxi province by 1000 years. It is believed, like those found at Yahu, that it may be one of the origins of Chinese script and characters. So it looks like the Chinese were the first to use writing. During the fourth phase of investigation, the foundation of a large building measuring 290 meters, 420 uh, square meters, 420 square meters if you included the outer courtyard was found. Known as F901, it was described by Chinese archaeologists as a communal meeting hall. It was built on an elevated rammed earth foundation that was then layered with burnt clay. It is believed to be the earliest example of a palace style construction. Inside was the earliest usage of a concrete floor in China. Measuring 130 square meters in area, it was constructed from congealed stone and sand, similar to the concrete that we use today. In fact, this predates concrete used by the Romans by thousands of years. One floor in room F411 contained a 1.2 meter long and 1.1 meter wide black painted drawing that has completely rewritten China's art history by 2000 years. Despite all these finds that have been recovered so far, archaeologists have only discovered 1.34% of the total area of Dadivan. Who knows what else can be found at the site? History books may have to be rewritten again. As Lang Shude of Gansu Culture Relics Research Institute stated, we are now only just scratching the surface, so expect more news from Chinese archaeology. In the past, various different cultures have had their own flood myth. Take for example the book of Genesis with Noah's Ark in the Old Testament or the epic of Gilgamesh from Sumerian folklore. You might dismiss these as fables and myths, but there is an element of truth to these stories. We are going to look at two major floods that occurred during the late 7th millennium BC or the early 6th millennium BC. One of these definitely happened, the other is subject to controversy. Let us have a look first at the one that definitely happened. From the end of the Younger Dryas in 9500 BC 
Britain had remained attached to continental Europe during the Mesolithic period. This had allowed Mesolithic hunter-gatherers to cross ever dry, over dry land to reach a forested peninsula that contained red deer and wild boar. For the next 3000 years, sea levels had started to rise due to the melting of the ice caps and glaciers, with the result that the connection between Britain and Europe became more marshy and prone to flooding. Ireland had already severed its links with Britain in approximately 8000 BC. In 6100 BC, it was like any other day for Mesolithic hunter-gatherers, particularly those that congregated on the eastern shoreline to either fish or collect seashells. Hundreds of miles away off the northwest coast of Norway, an underwater shelf 200 miles long containing thousands of cubic miles of rock collapsed deeper into the North Sea. This was known as the Storega or the Great Edge. What was left behind was a huge void that had to be filled by something. That something was an incalculable amount of seawater that emerged to spread in every direction towards Norway and unfortunately for the Mesolithic people on the east coast towards Britain. First thing people noticed was that the tide suddenly receded by a huge distance. What was going on? Seagulls would have flapped about in alarm, so they knew what was happening out to sea. Some of the more eagle-eyed people on higher ground would have noticed a speck in the distance and then bolted for the hills. A wind blew from offshore, a noise started to reverberate like an express train, and without warning, a 30-foot high wave would have been bearing down on those poor folk near the shoreline. Any chance of escape would have been nil. The force of the wave would have been such that anybody in its path would have been obliterated instantly. How we know that this tsunami happened was due to a study carried out by Professor David Smith of the University of Oxford at Montrose Basin, Angus, Eastern Scotland. What he found was a layer of sand that should not have been there. Such a volume and height of sand could lead to only one explanation, a tsunami. The damage it would have done would have been absolutely shocking. The tsunami itself got as far as the cars of Stirling, an area of tabletop flat land situated to the west of Stirling in the central part of Scotland. There was no doubt about it. This was the worst natural disaster ever to hit Britain, and nothing like this has happened since. Once the wave finally receded, what was left of the land bridge known as Doggerland was no more. It disappeared under the waves to become the remaining part of the southern North Sea. Britain was now an island, and any link to continental Europe was severed until the building of the Channel Tunnel. If you're looking at the story of Noah's Ark, the Black Sea Deluge hypothesis is possibly the closest for you. In 1997, William Ryan and Walter Pittman published evidence that a massive flooding of the Black Sea occurred in 5600 BC. Previously, glacial meltwater turned both the Black and the Caspian Sea into huge freshwater lakes that drained into the Aegean Sea. As the glaciers continued to retreat, various rivers changed course to empty into the North Sea, with the result that the levels in the Black Sea started to recede and evaporate. Elsewhere, global sea levels were rising, so it was only a matter of time until the Mediterranean burst its banks over a rocky sill at the Bosphorus. According to this theory, 155,000 Square kilometers of land was flooded, leading to a significant expansion of the Black Sea to the north and to the west. 200 times the amount of water over Niagara, Niagara Falls would have poured through the Bosporus each day for approximately 300 days. Four points then to back up this theory by Ryan and Pittman. Point number one, global sea levels had risen by 120 meters since the last ice age. Point two, Black Sea has been 
closed off and reconnected numerous times over the last 500,000 years. Several methods have been used to study the recent evolution of the Black Sea. That was point three. And point four is an event was supposed to have occurred during the last 10 to 12,000 years with water levels rising rapidly enough to cause notable events. Of course, this theory has been subject to much criticism. Opponents point out that water has been flowing out of the Black Sea as late as 15,000 years ago. The level of the Black Sea must have been higher than global sea levels, and these had already risen since the last ice age. A solid obstruction of the Bosphorus must have occurred that would have had to have a significant height on the south side, whilst water levels at the north side would be dropping. Lowlands around the Black Sea would already have been flooded. A large part of the geological community also rejects the idea of a catastrophic flood. A sustained long-term pressure from the Aegean Sea would have to be significant to bulldoze its way through the isthmus. Alternatively, enough of a difference in water levels would have to occur between the Aegean and the Black Sea. A study carried out in 2012 confirmed that there was no evidence of catastrophic flooding in the region. So there you have it, two different flood scenarios, one that definitely happened and another that is very controversial. But for now, we will leave it at this point as we approach 5500 BC. Thanks for listening and we will be back for the next chapter in our story where Chinese Neolithic cultures proliferate, the Vinca culture takes over from Starchevo in the Balkans, and a culture in southern Mesopotamia starts to have an influence on the existing Halaf and Asuna cultures in the north. Bye for now and thank you for listening. I am going to add a side note here. If you're interested in the epic of Gilgamesh for the flood, for example, I will be doing a reading of the epic of Gilgamesh in December as a sort of Christmas special for for fan of history. So we'll start on December 1st with a five minute summary of the Epic of Gilgamesh, the oldest literary work that is fiction. Uh, it's 4,100 years old from its oldest sources. And then I will publish all the tablets except the last one. So 11 tablets in 11 episodes leading up to Christmas. So I hope you listen to that. Thank you all and thank you Shane for an excellent episode.